If you'd open up your Bibles this morning with me to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I'd like to read verses 7 through 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to, the, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning we would ask that you would... Uh, honor us by your presence, your spirit's presence in our midst, that you would be our teacher today. And as we look at this gift of discerning of spirits, Lord, we really do ask for clarity in our own hearts and minds regarding this gift, and that you would use it, the use of what we are going to study here this morning as, as an encouragement, and also, Lord, as a reminder and warning that we ought to be discerners of what is true and what is not. We pray in Christ's precious name. Amen. Well, in all the lists of spiritual gifts, this gift appears only once. And it's found in the passage we just read in 1 Corinthians verses, uh, chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. Uh, in his book, uh, the um, Unwrap Your Spiritual Gifts, on page 94 and 95 by Kenneth Gangle, he points out that there are three categories of discernment. And only one of them really deals with spiritual giftedness. But I think we ought to get those, we need to understand those three things. So we're going to spend a little bit of time there, not a lot, but a little bit of time there so we would get a good grasp of it. Uh, I remember a number of years ago, I guess I had been in the ministry uh, uh, six months, it was a very short time, and I was uh, teaching a high school, Sunday school class at the time, Pretty good sized class, probably about 25 students. And um, as time went on, I became a lot more comfortable with it and um, uh, really enjoyed my time in that class. But there was one particular student in the class that really didn't particularly care for my teaching. And so she went to the senior pastor of the church and she said this, I've never forgotten this because the uh, the pastor came and talked to me about it. He said, um, this gal came in and she said, um, I think you need to replace uh, Mike Holtzinger in the Sunday school class. And he says, you know, I have the gift of discernment, and I just have discerned that he shouldn't be teaching this class. Now, you stop and you think about that for a few minutes, and you go, wow, that's pretty arrogant. Uh, but the problem really is, is that in the church today, we really don't have a good understanding of what spiritual discernment is about or discernment, period, is about. And frankly, in the church, we seem to be devoid of spiritual discernment most of the time. So anyway, with that in mind, as I just mentioned before, Kenneth Gangle uh, talks about three kinds of discernment. And the first one is what he called natural discernment discernment, or you could just call it plain old horse sense. The idea here behind this is that and it, this is what enables really every person, Christian or not, uh, to have sound or good judgment, and we often would call it that horse sense or common sense or something of that nature. It is the ability to make wise decisions by observing and understanding. And some people have more of it than others. And, and I really got to stress this. This kind of discernment or natural discernment is a learned trait. It's something you can teach yourself. We often would call it just being wise or, 
or using some wisdom. But discernment, natural discernment, is really important. And so that would be the first one. And everybody has that kind of discernment. And it would be great if believers would bring their natural discernment into the church, and then once they've come to know Christ, apply number two, spiritual discernment, which comes to every believer for, in two ways. One, as we are inoculated with the truth from the word of God, and secondly, as we just grow in Christ. It's a matter of spiritual growth and spiritual maturity. Romans chapters, oh, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, I think, speak right to that point. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And here's the part that I want you to hear. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The renewing of the mind through the word of God, sitting under the preaching of the word, sitting in classes, Bible studies, Sunday school classes, wherever it might be, where you can grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We start to develop then spiritual uh, discernment. And this is really important in the church. And I want to suggest that if, every, if anything that we hear today or, or thinking about today, when we're talking about discernment, this one's the most important. The gift of discernment is something entirely different, which we'll talk about in a moment. But this kind of discernment is really important. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 and 15 says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men in cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things in him who is ahead, Christ. So, well, the idea here that Paul is saying is we don't want to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. And if you read the verses just before this, starting at verse 11 up through 14, you'd realize what he's talking about here is he's given gifted people in the church and the teaching ministry in the church so that you and I would grow up in Christ and we would not be carried away by every wind of doctrine and the trickery of men. And this kind of discernment, I think, is super important. Uh, I can remember a number of years ago um, when uh, Growing a Healthy Church was the, the big book out there. And there were a number of others who, that were like it. But that one in particular was kind of um, important. And then there, there was a follow-up book, uh, growing, you know, developing a healthy Christian life and all of that good stuff. And uh, I ended up um, uh, at a conference where uh, in the group of people that I was with, they brought in for speaker Bill Hybels. And Bill Hybels was really into these, you know, this kind of thing where they would have a, it was very professional. They'd have a little, they'd have special music, they'd have music, all the music, and most of it was, by the way, was secular. They would have secular music, maybe with some new Christian music that they had dreamt up somewhere. And then they'd have one or two skits, maybe a, a, a little scripture reading to go along with it, and then a major skit to go along with that. And then at the end, a small little message to kind of wrap up the whole thing. And I sat through this service, if you can call it that. There was probably 1,500 of us in that room. And I, there was two things that I came away from. Wow, was this professional. And wow, was this shallow. There was nothing there. I, it kind of wanted to make me think about that old Wendy's commercial. The little old lady standing there saying, where's the beef? There just wasn't anything there. There was a nice skit and all of this type of stuff, but 
there was no concentration or exposition of the word of God. You see, in that kind of a situation, what we think is happening is that it's our job, the person in the pulpit, and the job of the church to make sure that we pour something into your skull that you can take home with you. The problem with that is, is that we're talking about spiritual truth and all I can do is preach the word of God and pray that God, the spirit, will do that work of teaching in your own life. And so I left there and I thought to myself, I don't know what it is that's wrong but it's wrong. You see, this, it was all about being seeker sensitive. Now, and if you've known anything about Bill Hybel's ministry, that was a big deal. He, he wasn't just seeker sensitive, man, it was seeker aggressive. And the problem with all of that is, is that no one comes to the Father unless the Spirit of God draws him. You didn't become a seeker on your own. And God draws us to himself. That is the seeking that we, that we experience. The Spirit of God doing something in our lives that draws us through the preaching of the word of God to conversion and then growth in him. Stop and think about it. When you listen to the word of God and you walk out of a church service, if I were to stand at the door and say, what was the one principle that you got or what was the one thing that really spoke to you today? I would get as many different answers to that as there are people in this room. I can think of two separate occasions where I preached on tithing tithing and people got saved I went I, I couldn't figure this out the answer to it is that that's what the Spirit of God does and so as I walked out of that service that day there was some discernment taking place some spiritual discernment and here's what it did it drove me back to the Word of God where I would ask myself is what I saw here tonight biblical? Is this what we should be doing in the church of Jesus Christ? Well, it didn't take me very long for the Spirit of God to drive home the point that it wasn't biblical. There's no such thing as a seeker. Read Romans chapter 3. There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. And so it becomes a word of God then that becomes that... Um, as it's inculcated into yours and my life, where we then begin to develop spiritual discernment. Hebrews chapter four, 5, verses 13 and 14, it says, For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised in discerning both good and evil. That's what the word of God does. God uses gifted people within the body of Christ, not denying that. But it is the word of God that those people share that brings conviction in a person's life and that the spirit of God uses in a person's life to change them. And so here in Hebrews, he says, don't be unskilled. Don't be a person who needs just milk. Get into the word of God. Study the word. Now, early on in my Christian experience, I was so novice at this, I didn't even know where the books of the Bible were. Did you, you ever have that problem when you were a brand new Christian? And so I hung to the Word of God. I got a decent study Bible, and I found a church that preached the text. <laughs> 
And it's amazing what God does when that happens. So we then develop, uh, we then develop discernment. We move away from being babes. We are now able to take solid food. And our reason is exercised. And we are then able to discern what is good and evil. And really, as I've already said, it's connected to, I think, not to a great extent, but to a super great extent, to our time in God's Word. How much time do we spend studying the Word? And, and by the way, uh, what we need to do when we study the Word is we ought to ask, what does the Word say? Not what does it say to me. That's secondary. We get that backwards sometimes. What does the word say? You ought to be hungry to grow in the word, to know the word of God. It will be that word that you put into you that the spirit will bring up to your mind when it is needed. And you'll be able to rightly apply it. I don't know how many times I still have that problem. I will read a passage of scripture that I'm, that I'm going through in my devotions. And that day I go, I just don't know. I don't, I don't know how I'm supposed to apply this. It will be within a couple of days. Something will take place. And the next thing you know, I'm applying the word of God. Or I'm able to, be, because I've been in the word, I've been able to discern what is true and what is not, because I've been in the Word and I've sat under good, sound teaching. In other words, we become sensitive to the small, still voice of the Spirit of God. And then third, of course, is the gift of discernment, which the Holy Spirit has given to some believers as a special gift. Uh, understand this, nobody has all the gifts. You have some gifts, you have a cluster of gifts. The spiritual gifts, spiritual gifts were never given out with the idea that certain gifts everybody should have. And it, such as tongues, for instance, you go into a charismatic church, a Pentecostal church, they'll flat out tell you that unless you speak in tongues, you're really not even baptized in the Spirit of God. And yet the scripture seems to be very clear about this. You have some gifts. And, they, and, and the combination of those gifts will be different than others. And so this gift of discernment is given to some believers as a special gift, enabling them to serve the church as watchmen and to identify by supernatural insight what is not true? Did you just get that? By supernatural insight, what is not true? So the next question we have to ask ourselves is, in this age, is it necessary in the body of Christ for someone to have the gift of, dis of spiritual discernment so that he would have supernatural insight? And I'm going to argue that is not necessary. We have something that is supernatural called the Word of God. Let me give you a definition. And that might help a little bit. The gift of distinguishing between spirits or spiritual discernment was a miraculous ability that enabled one to accurately assess and judge Inner motives, hidden errors, or corrupting doctrines. So, in other words, good spirits and evil spirits were miraculously distinguished by those who had this gift. And uh, what most often took place is, it was generally when we see this gift in scriptures, we're going to look at in a few moments, in scripture when it's used, it's followed by apostolic miracles. So, again, it is a miraculous ability 
that enables one to accurately assess and judge inner motives, hidden errors, or corrupted, corrupting uh, doctrines. Uh, there was a pastor here in the Seattle area of a very large church, very well known across the nation, this pastor was. Uh, he's no longer here. He's elsewhere. Uh, but I remember watching a message where he said that he had the gift of discernment. And he could discern who in the audience was having affairs and that kind of stuff. I thought, right. All he was doing was drawing attention to himself. And you can begin to see how the spiritual gift, which is a miraculous gift, all of the gifts, by the way, are miraculous. But here in particular, the idea is that it is a miraculous ability to accurately assess and judge inner motives. Now, certainly, during the infancy of the church, when Christians we're not blessed with the completed word of God as we are today. There was a special concern for false teaching and evil tendencies that would have a corrupting influence within the body of Christ. You can understand that. And uh, let me just uh, share a couple of passages that kind of deal with that. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter time, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to uh, deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer." Now you're saying, oh, wait a minute, Pastor, Didn't, you said this was for the early church, and here it says in the latter times. When did the latter days start? At Pentecost, that's when they started. The Apostle Paul thought the Lord was coming back in his lifetime. And so what we're talking about here is that in the early church, there was a real tendency, as we read elsewhere in Acts 23, for instance, where wolves come in, the body of Christ unawares deceiving the body of Christ. Or we read passages or whole books of uh, letters like Jude that warn us that already we have to go back and re-rehearse the basics of the gospel to the church because deceivers have come into the church. 1 John chapter 4 verse 1 through 3 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, I'm going to read the rest of it here, but understand here, this is really speaking about spiritual discernment, not the gift of discernment. But he says, it goes on to say, by this, you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is of God. And here the Apostle John is directly dealing with the doctrines of Gnosticism, the heresies of Gnosticism that had crept into the church. And what the Gnostics believed is that everything that was physical was evil and everything that was spiritual was good. So therefore, Jesus could not have come in the flesh. Now, if he had not come in the flesh, how would he then be able to propitiate on the cross of Calvary for you and I? That was the problem. And so he says, if, if, if someone comes into your midst and teaches this Gnostic doctrine, don't believe it. It's not of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now all is already in the world. John's writing this at 90 AD. So how were early Christians to distinguish between 
truth and error since we didn't have the completed word of God. The Apostle Paul and, and all of the apostles, they couldn't be omnipresent in all of these churches. They would establish churches, spend some time there, and get a group of elders uh, trained up, and off they would go. The bestowal of this gift then, of discernment, would have been extremely valuable to such a community of early believers. And we actually have two excellent illustrations of this gift being used. And they are both found in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 5 verses 1 through 4 with Ananias and Sapphira. We all know this story. Think, just let me read this and you'll see here. Again, remember? The gift of discernment is a supernatural ability. Okay? And what does it do? It, is, it enables one to accurately assess and judge inner motives, hidden errors, and corrupting doctrines. Well, with Ananias and Sapphira, we've got all kinds of hidden motives and hidden errors, don't we? And so we read in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, But a certain man named Ananias with, his, with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back a part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back a part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, it was, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart and, have, and you have not lied to men, but to God? So what they had done is they had sold some property and then they gave a portion of it to the church and says they gave it all to the church. And Peter was able to miraculously discern the lie. He had no other outside influences here. He knew that Ananias and Sapphira had lied. That is something that the Spirit of God had revealed to him. And I believe what we see here is the exercise of this particular gift of discernment. And then again, in Acts chapter 13, verses 6 through 10. Now, when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sir Gaius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. Elimus, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, there's a key ingredient, looked intently at him and said, O oh, fool of deceit and all fraud, you are the son of the devil. You enemy of righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? Now you might say, well, he's a false prophet, so maybe they would have picked up on that naturally. Remember now, we did not have the completed word of God. This pro council would not have known what was right or what was wrong. He didn't have 66 books of the Bible. He may have had the Old Testament, but he certainly didn't have the New Testament. And so what we have here, then, is the Apostle Paul discerning, and I believe it's the gift of discernment here, that this man is a false prophet, and he called him out on it. So in both cases, I think miraculous powers confirmed the severe judgments that were made when the spirits were discerned in both the instances, Ananias and Sapphira's death and the destruction of the sorcerer's reputation. Now, when we think about the gift of discernment, there's just a few things I'd like to leave with you that I think are important. When this gift is claimed today by individuals whose 
discernment really isn't confirmed as supernatural or miraculous. What we're going to have is controversy in the church and controversy with each other. Uh, that's that one young gal who was in my Sunday school class, she was just a teenager, and uh, she said, well, I have the gift of discernment. I don't think that Mike should be teaching this class. What she did, and she, what she did is she went and told several other the, other students, and we had a little bit of a forest fire to put out because of it. So conflict and controversy can take place when it's not the gift of discernment, and I believe that this gift of discernment really is for the early church. I don't see a place for this gift when we have the completed Word of God. Um, I said that about prophecy as well. Prophecy is the same thing. Where all of a sudden we're getting new revelation. There is no need for new revelation in the body of Christ. We have the completed word. So imagine the reaction of a person standing amongst, standing amongst a group of people. When, saying, when this person says... I got a word from the Lord, and you need to listen to me. And frankly, within the body of Christ, this kind of thing happens all the time. And all you have to do is turn on any of the so-called Christian radio stations, or TV, not radio, TV stations, and even some of the radio stations. I'm going, come on. There, there's one fellow out there I've quit listening to these guys, but there's one guy out there, every sermon, I don't care where he's at in the Bible, the topic is, you give me $1,000 and God will give you 10000 Every message, every time. And people buy into this. Why? Because they lack spiritual discernment. They are not in the word. God has given certain people in the early church, I believe, discernment. But when I hear someone say, well, I have the gift of discernment, I'm taken back by that a little bit. I believe that the only discernment you and I need to have is one developed from God's word and from the preaching of the God's word and from good Bible study, time in the Word itself. Certainly, we want to heed the warnings and, of a, a, and admonitions of Christians among us. Most definitely want to do that. Who are wise and knowledgeable and have developed spiritual discernment. However, we need to be very careful when we hear someone claiming to have the gift of spiritual discernment and telling you they know what you just did the other day or this or about a certain sin in your life that you haven't revealed to anybody. The messages and the response to such things you need to show real discernment. What we need in the body of Christ is people who desire to be discerners. Discerners out of the word of God. Those that are not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, that have grown up underneath the word of God and have built into their life not the milk of the word, but the meat of the word. And have spent time systematizing what they know. It's not enough just to have a bunch of Bible verses. You need to be able to systematize your doctrine. And know where to go to find it. That way, you'll have the spiritual discernment instead of the gift of discernment which is far more valuable.
which we are going to look in uh, the next time around, which will be in January, when we, January when we pick this back up, we'll be looking in that on that particular Sunday, the second week in January, regarding miracles and healing. And I believe those two gifts, as well, as well as this gift of discernment of spirits, really become just a way for some people within the body of Christ to draw attention to themselves. And frankly, it's fraudulent. So if someone says to you, I know what's going on in your heart. And they aren't your friend. They haven't spent time with you. They aren't discipling you. I'd be real cautious. What we need to strive for is not horse sense, not common sense, not even the gift of discernment, but just plain old spiritual discernment built around sweat and tears in the word of God and in prayer. That's what God will use in yours and my life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you now this morning for this time. We'd ask God that you'd bless your word. Lord, your word reaches into our hearts as we read in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It's like a two-edged sword. It's a discerner of the intents of our hearts. Lord, use that word in our lives. And use your word in us so that we can practice on ourselves to discern what's going on in our own lives, whether we have a walk that is genuine before the Lord or not. Teach us, Lord, to be of a teachable spirit. And that, Lord, we would be cautious about anyone who claims to have such a gift, especially ones that we do not know. And then, Lord, give us a desire to study your word so that we might be discerners of that which is good and that which is evil. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.